Oh, shoot. Forgot to add an animation? Oh, no. It's calamitous. It's okay. You're getting some previews before the official presentation. We use sick animation skills now. All right. Cool. I'll be recording. Nice. All right. So, yeah, so today we're going to be talking about the bicycle model. Um, yeah, chapter five is very long. I think we read about 30 pages. I think it's like a little more than 100 pages. So it only gets into like more crazy and in-depth explanations of things. Um, but yeah, it's all like every time I read it, I'm like, wow, I learned something new. It's always super interesting and gives me a better picture of what's happening when you're going into corners. Um, so yeah, I think that's pretty sweet. Oh, shoot. Are other people, are, am I cutting out for other people? A little choppy, but you're there. Okay. Everything you're saying for now. I can, I'm going to close the router. I'm just going to bug in the L, but that's okay. We'll see how this does for us. Okay. So, bicycle model. Boom. Let's get into it. So, uh, the first thing to talk about in this chapter is something called the ladder of abstraction. And this is an extremely useful tool or way to think about things, even outside of the context of like race car engineering. Um, just like generally in engineering, you're always having to be aware of how abstract your of a model you're working on. Like sometimes you're working on things that are like very, very abstracted from what's actually happening in real life. And sometimes you want to spend more time looking at the nuances and the complexities of things that are happening in real life. And as an engineer, you always need to know where you are on that ladder and understand what assumptions you're making at different steps along that ladder. So I thought that was a pretty nice introduction that they have in here. Um, so for our case, one thing about kind of vehicles, um, you can imagine the most basic, the most like abstracted version of a car is just imagine a single tire that can apply forces longitudinally, laterally, and we're only looking at the linear range of that tire. We're not worrying about weight transfer. We're not worrying about any of that crazy stuff. It's like literally just a simple like a point mass with the forces that can be applied to it. If you remember the conversation we were having the other night, it's the same thing as like a glider model. It's like a super simple, super abstracted version of a car. Uh, and then we can kind of move up the ladder and start adding all those complexities that a real vehicle might have. So things like now we have four tires. So now we need to consider things like weight transfer uh, in both lateral and the longitudinal direction. We might need to consider things like how slick is the road? Is it a gravel road? Is it concrete? Is it wet? Is it dry? We might start to have to consider things like tire temperature, you know, like all these crazy different effects that are going to change how our vehicle performs. That is much more complex but much less abstracted from what's happening in real life. It's actually accounting for things that might be occurring. But again, everything that we do as engineers is make models. And there's kind of a famous quote, like, all models are bad, but some are useful. And so this ladder doesn't really end. Like, you can always kind of go up and ask yourself more and more complex questions about what's actually true and what's not true. Like, are tires even real? Is anything even real? This ladder kind of goes into infinity. But the point of engineering is that you can get a crap ton done if you stay pretty low on the ladder still. So we're going to be looking at the bicycle model and that's pretty low to the bottom of the ladder, like basically one step up from a single tire model or a glider model. Okay. So what is the bicycle model? It is a very simplified model of the vehicle. Um, so there's no lateral weight transfer, which I know I talked a lot about last presentation, like what weight transfer is, why it matters. But for today, we're just going to scrap that. We're going to pretend that doesn't happen. And so because we have no lateral weight transfer, that's why we're assuming, that's why we're working a bicycle because now we can assume that there's no difference between our left and right tire, and so we can just look at the front and rear tires. And we're also going to assume no longitudinal load transfer, no rolling or pitching motions. We're looking at the linear range of the tires. This is critical. So if you guys remember the tire graph from last time, 
and I meant to put another one in the slide, I just ran out of time, but if you ever read a graph, there's a linear region and then a transitional region where it kind of becomes concave down. We're only looking at the linear region of the lateral force versus slip angle curve. Um, we're assuming a constant forward velocity and we're assuming no aerodynamic effects, sorry, Rohill, and we're assuming that you have positional control of the steering wheel. In an actual race car, you have to apply force to turn the steering wheel. We're going to assume that we can just like directly set the position of the wheels. Okay, so that's kind of a summary. I know it's very complex, very like doesn't mean much to you. So here's what it kind of looks like in the graphic. I'm sure you guys all saw something like this in the reading. Um, so you, we have a front tire. Let me get my pointer going here. We have our front tire here. We have our rear tire here. And the front and the rear tires are some distance away from the center of mass. So the front tire is distance A from the center of mass, and the rear tire is distance B from the center of mass. And the distance between the two tires is labeled as L, that's called our wheelbase. It's a pretty like fundamental vehicle characteristic that we look at, or that we, that we design. Um, oh God, sorry, I have to call this in my house. And so then this bicycle is turning around some turning center at some radius. Does this look like roughly familiar to everybody? Kind of get what's happening here. And so our front tire is applying some force here, and our rear tire is applying some force here. Everybody with me so far? Any questions? Thoughts, comments on the bicycle model? All right, cool, let's go. Okay, so what we're going to be doing here today so I skipped that door. So what we're going to be doing here is we're going to be looking at the way this bicycle model handles turning in different situations. Okay. So the first situation is a very low speed turn. And I say low speed turn, that's important because what this means is we're not generating any slip angles. That means we're not generating any lateral force, if you remember from the last video. So what's happening here is the car is turning purely about a geometric path. And that geometric path is defined by the radius or some circle that is tangent to the two tires, so the front tire and the rear tire. And these two circles are concentric circles. So you can kind of imagine your front tire and your rear tire are moving around a concentric circle, each with concentric circle. And so the center of your vehicle is sort of following along on some third concentric circle between these two. Okay. And the sort of steering angle here that is required to negotiate that turn is approximated by this equation L, which is our wheelbase, over R, which is the radius of the turn, which kind of makes sense. If we want a higher radius, we need a lower steering angle. They're inversely proportional. That makes sense? And this is called, that the steering angle required to negotiate a low speed turn is called the Ackerman steering angle. Any questions about that? Okay, I can keep going. Um, and yeah, please feel free to just like, you can stay unmuted and just like chat. I like to hear from you all, it's nice. Okay, here's a quick definition, and it might be a bit abstract right now, but it's very essential to understanding how the car turns, okay? And that is that your car can do two different things. It can yaw, and it can turn around a circle with a radius, or with a, a center of that turn that's sort of away from the vehicle. So the yawing case, which is on the left here, is when your vehicle is pivoting about its center of mass and it's pivoting about the sort of like vertical axis of your car. That's called the Z axis in this case. But you can imagine like, if this is your car, here's its axis, it's pivoting like this. Okay, that's called yawing. And we'll sort of get to how that comes into play in a little bit. Now, the other case is sort of like what we, what we might call a turn. And that's where this is directly caused by the sort of centripetal force that we were talking about in the last video. Turning is caused by having some lateral acceleration with some forward velocity. And that's your car going around a radius that is set at center is sort of away from the vehicle. So sort of your car going around this wider turn here. Does that make sense? Questions about that? And we'll get into why yawing happens in a little bit. Okay, great. Um, I'm gonna make a couple assumptions clear because these are in the chapter and they do say them, but they are confusing. 
And I'm probably not even going to explain them very well, but it's just important to note this is what we're talking about. So <laughs> we sort of had this conversation last time around like centripetal and centrif centrifugal force. Um, I did a little digging. I'm not sure if this is going to clear it up any too much, but basically we want to look at the vehicle in a static case, but the reality is that if you look at the vehicle, there's an unbalanced lateral force. So when the vehicle is turning, your tire is producing some lateral force. And in theory, like that's not a balanced force. And that is causing some acceleration of your car. It's causing, in our case, a centripetal acceleration, which is going to cause the car to go in circles. And it's easier for us to sort of look at a static lateral force case. So we're going to put this hypothetical force in, which we're calling the centrifugal force which is just going to be some negative MA. So we're just going to add this into our force equation to make it sum to zero. That's basically what's going to happen. The implications of that are not too extreme. We don't have to worry too much about it, but I just want to point it out. Okay, the other approximation they make is a small angle approximation, which I don't know if you are familiar with the small angle approximation, but it's basically saying that at very small angles, the sine of an angle is equal to the angle itself. And at um, and the cosine and at small angles, the cosine the cosine of an angle is pretty close to one. Okay, um, and so what that means here, and so the thing that's frustrating about RCVD is they sort of go back and forth between when they're using this and don't make it very clear. Um, so, but I'll I'll cover the implications of what that means when we go a bit further. For now, what it means, if you look at this little diagram on the screen here. The front lateral force is perpendicular to the direction of the wheel. But for the sake of balancing moments in the car, which I'll get to in a bit, they kind of treat it like this. I don't know if everybody saw that little transition. This is what it actually looks like. This is how it's treated in a lot of cases. It's okay. It doesn't impact. It makes the math a lot easier to do right now, and it doesn't have drastic impacts. And like I said, we're sort of still on that lower level of the ladder of abstraction. So it's okay to make some approximations here, um, as long as we're aware of them and are aware of what changes it would make if we got rid of those assumptions. Okay, now let's get into the actual stuff. Sorry, that was a lot of like prefacing, but now we're ready to talk about some stuff. Okay, the first case we're gonna talk about is the neutral steer vehicle. And the key feature in a neutral steer vehicle is that the distance between the wheels and the center of mass are equal to one another. That is to say, this distance A is equal to this distance B. And like I said before, L is equal to, is just called the wheel base. Okay, any questions? Okay. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna look at the force balance and the moment balance for this neutral steer vehicle. And so, like I said before, we're looking at a steady state turn. And steady state means that everything is in equilibrium. That means our forces are all in equilibrium, so our car is not accelerating in any direction and our moments are in equilibrium. Now, is everybody familiar with what a moment is? Or a torque? These two words are used interchangeably. Can I get thumbs ups in the, in the reactions? And if you are unclear, I'll just cover, I'll just give a quick synopsis either way. Um, so what a moment is, is when you are, it's basically a force that will, that will rise to a rotation of an object. And so if I have the Sharpie and I'm holding in the middle here, if I'm applying some force away from the pivot, so some force at some distance like D, that will cause rise to a rotation of the Sharpie. I'm not holding this very conveniently. That will cause rise to a rotation of the Sharpie. So when we're looking at moments, we're thinking about forces times the distance away from, in the car's case, force times the distance away from the center of mass because the car is going to rotate around its center of mass. Does that make sense? And please feel free. I know it's like hard to ask questions on Zoom and in presentations, but like, if that doesn't make sense, I'm happy to cover it in a different way. I did that sort of mediocrely. Okay. So I'll just keep going then, but again, feel free to interrupt me or put, or you're also, you're also welcome to DM me directly in the chat and I'll, and I'll just reread the question and answer it. Cause I'm sure if you have a question, a lot of people have a similar question. Okay, so uh, another assumption that we're gonna make is that the car is acting like sort of a rigid beam. And we're assuming this car is acting like this rigid beam and it has some force applied up here. 
some force from the front tires, some force applied down here from the rear tires. And then again, this is sort of this like centrifugal, like made up force that we're gonna use to balance the force equation. Uh, so this sort of diagram on the left here and the diagram on the right here are the same thing. We're just treating the car like one big rigid body. Okay, so let's get into these forces a little bit more. So you remember from last time that a tire will produce a lateral force at a given slip angle. So we know when we're turning that we're gonna have some lateral forces in our tires and that's labeled FF in the front and FR in the rear. And so the lateral forces are equal to the cornering stiffness of the vehicle times the slip angle that that tire is at. Sorry, and the cornering stiffness, I put this message in the chat but I'll cover it again. The cornering stiffness is the derivative of the lateral force versus slip angle plot. And so in the linear range, what that derivative looks like is a constant value that tells you how much lateral force your tire is going to produce per degree of slip angle. This is an important point and I'm gonna talk about cornering stiffness a lot in this presentation. So does that definition make sense? So you can see some yep. nods. So that means that the tire force that is being generated is equal to this cornering stiffness, which again is a constant value that is in lateral force per slip angle times the slip angle. So cornering stiffness times slip angle gives us our lateral force. So when we're in a turn, we know that our front tire is producing some amount of force that's caused by its slip angle, and the rear tire is caused by some amount of, is causing, is producing some amount of force caused by this cornering stiffness times some slip angle. And for this case, we're going to assume that the cornering stiffnesses of the front and the rear tires are equal to one another. They're the same. Cool. So you might be wondering, okay, so I'm sorry, here is what these equations look like. These are sort of our force balance and moment balance equations. The force balance one is equal to this front tire force. So the cornering stiffness of the front tire times the slip angle plus the cornering stiffness of the rear times the rear slip angle. And that again is equal to sort of this centripetal acceleration force, which is going to be equal to this centrifugal acceleration just to keep things static. But you can basically just think of like, these are the sum of forces. And as long as these are equal to this inertial force, we're in a steady state. Now, here's our moment equation. Our moment equation is that same force. So this corner stiffness times slip angle times its distance away from the center of mass. So this cornering force times distance A plus cornering force times distance B. And actually this should be a minus because this distance B is technically gonna be negative here. And that is what's going to cause these two values to be the same and to sum to zero. So what we're trying to achieve here, the important thing to note here is that when we're going around a corner, what we want to achieve is we want to make these go to zero. We want these forces and these moments to be balanced. And that's what's gonna bring us into the steady state turn case. Another thing to note is that the vehicle sort of in most cases acts as sort of like a stabilizing force and so it will try and like balance itself but i'll go a little bit more into what that means okay so you might be wondering where do these slip angles come from and so what i'm going to do is sort of walk through the steps of what happens when we go through a turn okay so we start our view our wheels are pointed in the same direction uh, and the first thing we're going to do when we begin to turn is you probably could guess this is we're going to turn the front wheel by steering the steering wheel. And what this is going to do is it is going to generate a front slip angle. And that front slip angle in turn is going to generate some lateral force to the front tire. And that lateral force is going to give rise to some force times some distance A from the center of mass. And so now our sum of moments is unequal and it's going to look like this coordinates lateral force times A. And what that's going to do is it's going to cause our car to begin to rotate. So we're driving forward, we turn the front wheel, our car starts to rotate. What's gonna happen next is as our car is yawed, and again, when I say yaw, I mean it's pivoting about its center of mass. When our car is yawed, our, this is going to give rise to a rear slip angle because now we're sort of dragging that rear tire on the ground. And when there's a rear slip angle, there's going to be a rear lateral force. And what that rear lateral force is going to do is it's going to sort of fight the moment then produced by the front to try and stabilize the yaw of the car. Okay. Now at this point, it gets kind of funky, but it's very important. And that is now that our rear is generating, now that our front and rear tires are generating these different slip angles, 
the entire vehicle now is going to be traveling along an axis that is not its heading. So we can describe this as something called the body slip angle. So we have, you know, we've been talking about slip angles of the tires. Now our entire vehicle has a slip angle where it's pointing one way, but traveling a different direction. And the angle at which it's traveling is going to be equal to the rear slip angle because our rear slip angle and our, our, rear, our, rear, slip, our rear tire is sort of fixed to be along the X axis of the car. So we're sort of going to assume now that our car is being forced to sort of travel along that rear slip angle but it's going to be pointed in the other direction, which is kind of confusing, but does the body slip angle concept make any sense? Is the fact that, so the body slip angle beta being equal to the rear tire slip angle, is that an approximation that's pretty good through most of your whatever range or is that like, it is the same because of this geometry? It is the same. I have spent a lot of time trying to wrap my head around this as well. So I can give you the best of my understanding and my thinking about this. So the critical thing is that your rear tires are sort of fixed to be along this pointing the same direction as your vehicle and that your front tires in a sense are like more free to rotate, I guess. And so all that's happening so when you, when you steer your car, and I, I think I didn't make this point very clear, but like when you are steering your car, especially in a neutral steer case, um, the slip angles that you're generating in your front are only there to give rise to what's happening in the rear. Like your front isn't really what's steering your car very much. It's actually like the rear slip angles that are being generated to meet those. And you, if you can kind of imagine like, the different radii. Actually, I get into this in the next slide, so maybe that'll help. But um, yeah, yeah, I don't really know how to give a better explanation of this. Like, I think it's just an assumption you should take to be true right now. And if there's some more thinking we can do about this as a group. Yeah, that's fair. That might help. We're going through our CBD later, so. Yeah, they don't give a great explanation. They kind of just say that it's what it is. So I've tried to reason through it. I haven't gotten a, def I haven't gotten like a satisfactory answer why this is true, except for that it kind of makes sense because they're fixed to be pointing in the same direction. All right, so now our vehicle, so sorry, so now let's keep going. So our vehicle now has some slip angle. So now our rear wheel is kind of moving like this, our front wheel is moving along its slip angle, and our vehicle is now moving along its third kind of slip angle. And because our vehicle has to rotate as it's going about that slip angle, that will actually turn our front tires a little bit again. And so we'll need to sort of adjust the steering angle of our front tire to balance the yaw moments once again. But ultimately what's gonna happen here is that in the neutral steering car, um, the rear slip angle and the front slip angle are going to be the same. And they're going to end up being the same because they have the same cornering stiffness they have the same distance away from the center of mass. And so in order for our moments to be balanced, these, our slip angles need to be the same. Do people follow along with that logic? Cool. So now our slip angles are equal, the yaw moment is balanced, and we've reached our sort of steady state condition. Okay. This is a diagram of sort of what this looks like. Basically, the Green here is the radius that the center of mass is taking. The blue circle here is the radius of the turn that the rear tires are taking. And this circle that it's traveling along is determined by the direction that the wheel is moving. So here's the direction it's pointing, here's its slip angle, and here's the direction that that tire is actually moving. And so uh, this is generated by some purpose. This, this line here is perpendicular to or the, the wheel is traveling on a path. Oh my gosh, I'm going to this. Okay, the radius of the circle that the rear wheel is moving along is perpendicular to the direction that it's moving. So this is sort of this tangential velocity. This is the path that it's moving along. And the same thing is true for the front. And so, oh, we, 
Oh, it's you, Um Yeah, so this is like a small picture of what this looks like. And when you change where the center of mass is located or the corner surfaces of these tires, you might end up sort of changing where this radius is, is one way you can think about it. Um, I don't know how well this graphic is, but it's it sort well, of gave me a, yeah, yeah, go for it. Uh, why is the center of mass not located like between the wheels? Like if you were to connect the centers of the wheels with a line, shouldn't the center of mass fall along that? It is? It is on that line. There's a gray line. It's hard to oh, see. Okay, yeah, yeah. But it is along that yeah, line. Yeah, never mind. Okay. Yeah. Um, so here's another sort of useful framework to think about this with, and that is this constant radius test. And so what a constant radius test for a car is, is where you're trying to keep the car going along the same radius path, but you're just going to increase its speed. And so as you increase its speed, you sort of know, as we know from before, that that V squared over R relationship, if R is constant and uh, we want to increase V, we're going to need to increase the lateral force as well. And so uh, we're now going to define a quantity here, and that is the change in slip angle divided by the change in lateral acceleration. So that's that delta alpha divided by delta a y. And so for a neutral steer case, um, if we plot this required slip angle to negotiate the turn versus its versus the lateral acceleration required for the front and the rear, the front and the rears will have the same slope. So this is to say that as we need more lateral force, we'll get that by increasing the slip angles in the front and the rear at the same rate. And that's purely a geometric thing caused by where the, by how far the front and rear wheels are from the center of mass. Okay. Is it also a, it's, is it also dependent on the relative cornering stiffnesses? It is also dependent on the relative cornering stiffnesses, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but for our case, we're assuming they're the same. So, okay. I know this is a lot of like abstract stuff, but I think it makes more sense when we look at the understeer case next. Okay, so here's some key takeaways. When the distance between the front track and center of mass is the same as the rear track, the slip angles in the front and the rear have the same effectiveness. That's kind of like the most clear way to say it. Is it like when we're generating slip angles, they have equal effects in the yawing of the car, which we need to balance, and the lateral force in the car, which we need to balance. Uh, and the other nice thing is that those are generated at the same rate. And what those two things kind of combined together means is that, and this is something that I'm still grappling with, so I can't, I'll do my best to answer questions about this, but this means that the same steering angle is required to negotiate the same radius turn at any speed for a neutral steer car. Because the slip angles are generated at the same rate. And the slip angles are generated like relative to how much lateral force is needed. And so as you increase that lateral force requirement, the, in, the slip angles will increase proportionally and they'll increase proportionally at the same rate. So we don't need to account for anything by changing the steering angle. Which is very strange. And the other strange thing is that the steering angle that's required is equal to that of the Ackerman case. So the steering angle required to negotiate any turn is basically L over R for an interest car. Okay, now let's see what happens when we change to an understeer case. And I think this will sort of point out some important relationships that will help us make a little bit more sense. Okay, so now for an understeer car, we're going to move the center of mass forwards, okay? So now A is equal to sort of one-third of the wheelbase, and B is equal to two-thirds of the wheelbase. So now when we look back at these four moment balance equations, you'll see that the front is providing sort of four thirds the amount of force and the rear is providing two thirds the amount of force. And so then for the moments to be equal, this means that in the front, we need one third, the, or sorry, we need four thirds, the slip angle. And in the rear, we need two thirds of the slip angle compared to the neutral steer car. So we can see here that the required slip angle to make the same turn for the understeer car in the front is four thirds that is required in the neutral steer car. And in the rear, we need two thirds the amount of slip angle. Okay. 
I think I made some jumps there. So what, some people have questions about this? No, it's making sense. Okay, no. all right, cool, cool. So let's kind of go through this again, the steps of what's happening in the turn. Okay, so let's assume that we are going down, we're driving our understeer car now, our center mass is way forward, um, and we're going into a turn, and we're gonna go to take the same radius turn that we did in the neutral steer car, okay? And so let's say we go in and we turn our front wheels to the same steering angle that we did in the neutral steer case. So we're assuming, so like as drivers, you know, we don't know, maybe we don't know we're in an understeer car. So we're gonna go into this corner and we're gonna turn our steering wheel the same amount as we did before with the neutral steer car. So what's gonna happen is again, we're gonna generate that yaw moment, which is going to begin to pivot our car. And as that car is pivoted, the rear tires are deformed and those are going to give rise to rear slip angles. But now the rear slip angle is only two thirds that of the neutral steer case because our front steering input isn't nearly as effective as it was before because we're fighting against a smaller sort of moment arm, if you will. So now, you know, we're applying the same amount of slip angle here, but that slip angle times the smaller radius means that the rear slip angle needs to be smaller to balance this effect, to balance the yaw moment equation. Does that, did what I just said make sense? Can you repeat that again? Yeah, absolutely. So what we're saying here is, again, step one, we steer our front wheels the same amount that we did in the neutral, the neutral steer case. And so that's going to mean that we generated the same amount of slip angle, which means we're generating the same amount of lateral force from this tire. However, the same amount of lateral force times a smaller radius here, a smaller distance from the center of mass is going to result in less yaw moment. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Same force times a smaller radius, smaller moment. So then to counteract that moment, the rear only needs to, the rear needs to apply less slip angle. Less because, slip angle, okay. Because or it, it can apply less lateral force because it is applying that lateral force to a larger radius or to a larger moment arm. Oh, okay. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay, so now, so now our rear slip angle is only two thirds of what it was in the neutral steer case. So now- Good question. Yeah. Um, does the change in where the center of mass is located change the lateral force generated by the tires at all? Okay, so that's a good question. I'm glad you asked that. Uh, so it does, as we discussed in the last video, if you add more normal force to your tire, you'll get more lateral force out of it. But remember that that happens at a decreasing rate, whereas the amount that it changes yaw moment due to the position of the center of mass is a strictly linear relationship. And linear relationships are more important or more powerful, if you will, than like square root relationships. And so okay. in our case, it's more important that in our case, the center of mass placement has more effects on the over under two characteristics in the yaw moment sense than it does in the sort of like tire load sensitivity case. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Cool. Okay. So what was I saying? Okay. So the rear slip angle is only two thirds of what it was in the neutral steer case. And this means if you believe me, the body slip angle equals the rear slip angle, that our body slip angle now is only two thirds what it was in the neutral steer case. If our body slip angle is only two thirds, that means that we're going along a path of a larger radius. If you believe me there. So this is saying that in an understeer car with the same steering input as we gave the neutral steer car, we will turn along a larger radius path. And so to get to the correct radius path, we need to apply more, more slip angle at the front to sort of force the rear to turn out more. And we do that by steering the car more. So the key takeaway here, well, so I'll get to this key takeaway in a little bit, but that's why this is called an understeer car because for the same given steering input, it will understeer the turn by instead of taking this path, it's gonna take a wider path. Does that make sense? 
sort of. Yep. Kind of a little bit. Any questions? Am I explaining something poorly? Or we don't believe you about something? Okay. We'll keep going for now. And then, yeah, sweet. Okay. So here's kind of the same plot that we were looking at before. And this is the slip angle requirement per lateral force. In an understeer car, to get the same amount of lateral force requires a higher amount of slip angle in the front than it does in the rear. As compared to the neutral steer case, so this left plot is the understeer car, the right plot is a neutral steer car. The neutral steer car, the front and the rear are on the same line. In this plot, the front is going to require more slip angle to produce the same amount of lateral force in a turn. Than the rear. These kind of like, it's not that like, it's not like the one just shifts up, they kind of spread like that. Does that make sense? Yep. So at the, at the same lateral force point, we'll be requiring more slip angle from the front and less slip angle in the rear than in the neutral steer case. Cool. Okay, so key takeaways like I said before, an understeer car is one that at the same steer angle will travel on a larger radius path. And in a more general form, any change that causes the required slip angle from the front to be higher than the rear will cause understeer characteristics. So it's sort of the same thing as saying if you change the cornering stiffnesses that would require more slip angle in the front, that would also cause understeer characteristics. So if your tires were like weaker in the front, you would understeer. Which you can kind of imagine like if your rear tires were super sticky and the front tires were ice. If you tried to like turn your wheels as much as possible, you just go straight forward. Cool. Any questions about understeer cars? Keep going. Okay. So now let's do the same thing for the oversteer case. The nice thing is it's pretty symmetrical. So like very similar effects are going to happen in very similar ways. Um, so now in the now in an oversteer case, uh, to balance the moments, we will now need four thirds as much slip angle in the rear as we did in the neutral steer case, and two thirds as much slip angle in the front as we did in the neutral steer case. So now our slip angle in the rear needs to be twice that than the slip angle in the front to balance the car. Do people kind of see that in the math? So we have now that A is two thirds and B is one third. For these two quantities to be equal, we need the slip angle in the rear to be four thirds and the slip angle in the front to be two thirds. Very same thing as the neutral as the um, understeer car, but now the quantities are just reverse for front and rear. People see that? Cool. Yep. So now, again, what's going to happen here is, let's say we're going to this turn. We're in an oversteer car now, but we don't know it. We still think we're in a neutral steer car, so we generally give some steering input the same as you did in the neutral steer car. Um, and that's going to, that sort of front rotation is going to give cause to a rear slip angle. But now that we've given the slip angle in the front, our slip angle in the rear is going to be twice what we needed it to be. And so with this huge slip angle in the rear, now our body is going to be turning much harder than we expected. And so because this is too large, we would need to reduce the amount of steering angle. that effect makes sense? Okay. So the graphs now are kind of looking very similar, except they're flipped, where now we, for the given lateral force, we're going to be having much more rear slip angle than front slip angle. Okay. So if you had a car with the mass, like basically the center mass basically on the rear tires, what that means is that you'd need very little steering input to generate a slip angle required to turn you around a given radius. Yeah. But if you had your weight all on your front tires, you'd need a, a massive amount of steering input in order to get your car to turn around a given radius turn. Exactly. Okay. And that's directly due to having to balance yaw moments. 
Um, I have another question. We can leave it to the end, though, if you want. Um, about what you mentioned about um, the Ackerman case for a given radius, the required steering input is the same as the like high speed case. For the same radius, the Ackerman case and the high speed case require the same steering angle. The only thing that really changes is the center of rotation in the in the, yep. the low speed cases along a line. Like it's at that uh, section along the axle. The rear tire. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but in the high speed case, it is perpendicular to the vector that defines the vehicle slip angle. Yeah. And we can talk about this at the end if you want, but I'm curious about the behavior of the motion of that um, center of rotation. Um, is it a gradual transmission or is the reason it's in the two different places because we're looking at two different steer cases that use different assumptions? That's a good question. Yeah. Yeah, we talk about that at the end. I don't know if I have a crisp answer. I, I'd yes. imagine it's, I think it's probably more the latter, but yeah, the, these things are, can be complicated in that sense. Yep. Okay. But yeah, that's a good question. Okay. Um, cool. So that's kind of everything I have for neutral steer cases, oversteer cases, and understeer cases. Do people have questions about those? Like, they can be clarification questions, they can be extension questions, like, what other factors might play into this? Just like whatever people are feeling. Um, can I just clarify, like, the body slip angle stuff? Um, so, yeah. it's is it dependent on the back wheel? Or like, why is it dependent on the back wheel? Yeah, okay. Let me see if I can think of the best explanation here. Okay. Can you go back to the drawing that has the three radii? Yeah. Nay, I could try and give my understanding of why you like. Yeah, go for it. Um, so like, so throughout this, the steps of the stuff, you're inducing a front slip angle, which creates a rear slip angle. And when you're, you're gonna reach a steady state where they're gonna be balanced. And in the neutral steer case, they're gonna be balanced. The forces are gonna be balanced and the slip angles are gonna be equal on the front and the rear. Mm -hmm. And the slip angle defines the direction of motion. So if you look at the two directions of motion, if you think of a body and like one half is going that way and the other half is going that way, we can draw lines that go perpendicular and those lines are gonna define the center of rotation. And so in this graph, that's the blue and the red lines that go to the middle point. And so the car is gonna rotate about that point and we can then draw another line to the center of mass and a tangent line will define the direction of motion of the center of mass. And that's purely geometric. That's just like, we can pick any other car, any other point on the car, draw a line from the center of rotation to that point, and the perpendicular will be the direction of motion. That's just a geometric mm -hmm. property of surface. Mm -hmm. And because the two slip angles on the front and the rear are the same, any point, if, if you imagine any point along that, um, pick any point along that line, like the center line of your bicycle model, you're going to get the same angle. I guess that's not quite correct, but it, it comes from the fact that it's balanced in between the two points. This is tricky. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this is tricky. Okay, actually, let me redefine what the body slip angle is. It is not necessarily the same as the rear slip angle. Okay. In a, the way that they later define the body slip angle is as the line that's so if you have some forward velocity and some sideways velocity, it's the sine of that angle, or the, I guess the tangent of those two vectors. 
I think what they're trying to get at okay. with the sort of it being the same in the rear when we're looking at these like turning cases is that the your body will not start to generate a slip angle until the rear starts generating a slip angle. All your front is going to do is yaw your vehicle. And yawing your vehicle isn't going to necessarily give rise to a body slip angle because a body slip angle is changing the direction that your body is traveling relative to the direction that it's facing. And so when you're just when you're simply pivoting your vehicle about its center, you're not quite doing that yet. And so it's not until you are generating rear slip angles that is causing your entire body now to travel along some new radius. Um, that that is happening per se. And so okay. like the, the generation of a body slip angle is directly related to the generation of a rear slip angle as you're like, as you're beginning to turn. And then what's happening is like at the end, once, once like, once your rear slip angle has stopped generating a, well, sorry, once your retire has stopped generating a slip angle because it's balanced the yaw moments, be following with what I'm saying with that. Yeah. then your body slip angle will be at its constant value. But okay. the body slip angle... Wait, that's once the rear tire has stopped generating a slip angle or it stopped or generating... Reach, has stopped changing a slip angle, then it's generating. Okay. Has reached some constant slip angle. Yeah, sorry, that was misworded. No, that's fine. Um, So that's when it's constantly turning, is that it? So yes, but that being said, there is some relationship between like, like in the neutral, or sorry, in like the understeer case, you're still going to change that body something. Like it's going to be too small, if you will. But I'm trying to think, I'm trying to figure out why that's like related. Well, I guess if you think about it that way, it kind of, like, kind of necessarily means what you're saying. Because your body, okay. yeah, I mean, that's, I guess that's what it is. Is like, if you're, if you're, okay, it's the start. Let me just make okay. it an okay way to think about this. Yeah, I'm just going to talk about, Kyle, tell me what you think about this, okay? So, as you, so you're going to turn your front tire, and you're going to start yawing your vehicle. And as you yaw your vehicle, now that's going to start dragging your rear tire and that your rear tire is then going to build up slip angle and that slip angle is going to begin countering the yaw generated by the front and that's just going to bring you into a steady state. But the rear slip angle only gets generated as much as the body begins to slip or rotate. And I think that's why those necessarily need to be the same. Because your body, the body, the body rotation is fundamentally what's causing that rear slip angle to be generated. Yeah. Right. Okay. So and so right your rear slip, your rear slip angle will only be as much as your body is rotating, and that will necessarily be whatever it needs to be to balance the moment caused by the front tire forces. Okay. Makes sense. And it will be constant while it's not. Well, it's not really like starting to turn. It's already like in the turn. Yes. Yeah, so exactly. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah, the rear slip angle does require a kind of constant rotation of the car. So when you start to turn, the whole car is going to rotate, like it's going to yaw. Yeah. What's going to happen is your your rear slip angle is a function of yaw. Yeah. Or mm -hmm. the direct, like it's a, your your like slip angles are generated when you have a velocity vector that doesn't map that is not in line with your wheel direction. And so if your wheels are just rolling, they're in line, you have no slip angle. And the, the, the longitudinal component of the rear velocity vector is constant if you're at a constant speed. So when you rotate the vehicle, what you're doing is you're, you're increasing the lateral, you're adding a lateral component of velocity to the rear tire. And so when the whole, when your body rotates, both the front wheels are, have now have lateral velocity. And the front mm -hmm. lateral velocity comes from an induced slip angle. 
the rear lateral velocity creates a slip angle. And that slip angle then will change, that, that slip angle generates a force, and the forces then change the rotational speed of the car. And what happens yep. is those forces change until the rotational speed of the car hits a constant value, but it will still be rotating at a constant value. So like if you put a camera above the, like above the car and look down and you like normalize the car for the rotate, like if you, if you took out the like motion of the car going in a circle, you just see the car just doing like spinning around its center when as in a turn. And so the equilibrium case, it's, it's important to think that the car is still spinning, it's still yawing, and that yawing is what's constantly creating, it's constantly keeping that slip angle held. Because you mm -hmm. only have a slip angle if your wheel is kind of moving sideways. Yeah. Okay. And so the reason the rears are the same as the body slip angle is because the rears are necessarily generated by your body yawing. And so when your body reaches the yaw like angle required for the rear slip angles to counter those at the front, it's like your body's gonna rotate the amount until that's happening. And because your rear wheels and your body are fixed to the same axis, then they both rotate the same amount. And so those like attitudes are gonna be the same. And that's why we say like the body slip angle is the same as the rear slip angle. Okay. Cool. Sounds good. No, that that like helped my understanding too. That was great. So thanks everybody. Where does the sorry? No, no, go for it. Where does that Ackerman come into play with all of this? Where does the Ackerman steering angle come into play with all of this? Like I feel like it was mentioned and then I don't exactly know like how it applies. Yeah. Um Let me ask that question. So, I mean, the Akron steering angle, like what's on the slide right now, is just like the geometric, like the geometric perfect turn that your car would take if there weren't slip angles, right? Okay. And so, in the the only time that the only other case where this is like kind of true is the neutral steer case. And I'm, it's not even like it's taking the same turn because as Kyle said earlier, like this one is related to, I don't know if you can see this, but the way that you calculate the Ackerman turn is you sort of draw a line perpendicular to your rear wheel and then a line perpendicular to your front wheel and where those intersect is your turning center. And okay. that's like a perfect Ackerman turn. Um, and so it sort of turns out that in a neutral steering case, the steering angle required to hit that radius is the same as the Ackerman steering angle. I haven't proven to myself why that's true yet. So I can't give you a good answer for like why that's necessarily the case. Because it's not, I think the radius might be the same, but the center of rotation is different because now the center of rotation is perpendicular to the directions that your wheels are traveling, which is no longer perpendicular to the direction that they're facing. Yeah. Um, I think it or, sorry. I think it comes from the fact that in the Ackerman case, your steering angle and your radius, they are, they have a relationship that is kind of, that is associated with the curvature of your, of your turn. So you can think of your, your Ackerman steering angle. It, it's going to be an angle, like a, some number of radians, but you can also think of that angle being a description describing the curvature of your turn. And so if you're gonna take the same turn with the same radius, with the same curvature at high speed, so in the, in the neutral steer case, high speeds, so there, there are slip angles generated and stuff, you still have to have the same kind of motion of curvature because you're taking the same circle. And so that, that angle that describes the motion and the curvature of that motion has to be the same because there's, there's, a, there's a, you know, if you have, there's going to be some geometric kind of transition where, you know, you can take your angle and multiply it by stuff and whatever, by the radius and whatnot, and you'll be able to describe the curvature of your circle. And so if you have the same circle, you have the same curvature. So you have to have the same angle that describes that motion. The only thing that's changed is the rotational center has changed. So instead of the rear basically being straight and the front being tilted, now, because your, your, your center of rotation is more in line with 
your center of mass. Now you're now everything is tilted. Your center of mass is tilted. Your front is tilted a lot, and your rear is tilted out a little bit in terms of motion. But that's my understanding of why why they're the same. It's not mathematically based, but okay. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, I think that's basically what it says in RCV2. All right, sweet. Um, okay, I've got a few more things at the end here. Um, all right, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about some unbalanced equations of motion. And these are kind of wacky. I skipped all the derivation to get to these equations. That's in the book. They're in the pages that um, I sort of like suggest that I said you should read, but I know that's there towards the end. There's like the last five or so pages and it's kind of math heavy. So this is like the equations that they get to. So I'm just going to break these down really quick because I think it provides a little bit of like interesting insight into the way the vehicle handles. Okay. So there's a lateral force equation and a yaw moment equation. So these are very similar to the ones that I put on the board earlier, but with a little more general this generalization that Okay, so the lateral force has three, they each have three terms. There's the body slip term, which you can see here is the sum of the um, corner extendances times the body slip, plus a yaw, it's called the yaw coupling term, but this is basically looking at the way lateral force is produced due to R, which is the yaw velocity of the vehicle. So like how quickly, the, the rate at which your body is rotating. And then there's a steering term which is purely related to the um, corner systems of your front tire and the steering angle. And then we also look at very similar things in the yaw moment case. This is literally the same equation, but we've just added in the distances from the center of mass. So there's a body slip term, which is related to how far do the stiffnesses of your tires and how far they are from the center of mass. There's this yaw coupling term, which is related to the yaw velocity. And then there's a steering term. Okay, so if you look at this, this kind of makes some sense. This body slip term is saying, okay, we know the slip angles that both of our tires have are some function, are related to the slip of the body. And so the amount of lateral force that we're producing is that body slip angle times the cornering stiffnesses. So again, cornering stiffnesses, force per slip angle, force per slip angle times slip angle, we get some force. This is saying, okay, we have some cornering stiffness at some distance and that is being rotated. And so that rotation, if you imagine you have something rotating, you can sort of get its tangential velocity, so its side velocity um, by multiplying by that distance. So you have some rotation times some distance, you get that tangential velocity. And then we are going to divide that by, this is inversely proportional to the vehicle's like heading speed. Um, so this is basically saying as you're rotating your vehicle, as you're yawing your vehicle, you're sort of dragging those tires and that's producing some lateral force. And then lastly, we know some steering angle at the front, which is going to change that slip angle a little bit. will create this, um, this, that times the corner to the front will create some lateral force as well. The important thing here is now we're no longer looking at these in a balanced case. So these are going to give rise to unbalanced forces that are going to side slip our car and rotate our car. Okay. And then there's sort of, like I said, there's sort of similar terms in the, moment case. But what's interesting, so what we do here is we can treat these. So what we're going to do is we're going to take partial derivatives, which is kind of scary, but it's okay. And what that's going to give us here is if we look at this lateral force function, this lateral force equation as a function of our vehicle slip angle, our yaw velocity, and our steering angle, we can treat these terms in front of the in front of them as sort of these partial derivatives saying that this is some change in lateral force per some change in body slip angle times the body slip angle. That's going to produce a lateral force. Same thing for the yaw coupling term and for the steering term. So we're going to do that for both of these. We're going to say, okay, the lateral force and the yaw moment are functions of three quantities, which is body slip angle, yaw velocity, and steering angle. And there's some quantity or there's some some constant times those different quantities that's going to tell us how much lateral force we have and how much yaw moment we have. 
All right. So what I'm going to do really quickly. So here's the entire list of them on the right hand side. But this is basically just saying that these different quantities are the same things as what were in the equations before. But they each have very like important meanings for the way a vehicle handles. So I know this is like kind of a mess of equations and stuff. I would recommend like if you have this speaker view on, try and minimize that. Um, so basically each of these terms in front of our different quantities is going to give rise to the value of each of these partial derivatives. And so I'm gonna go through each one and kind of give its physical significance because I think it gives some cool insight into the car. Okay, we're gonna start with the yaw ones because they make a little bit more sense. Okay, so the first one is, um, oh, okay, so the, yeah, I'll kind of flip back and forth. The first one we're gonna look at is the sort of partial derivative of our yawing moment as compared to our steering angle. And so the quantity here is A, which is the distance between your front wheel and the front wheel's cornering stiffness. And this is called our steering angle derivative. And so basically what this tells us is it's a proportionality factor between the yawing moment of our car and the steering angle that we're given. So it's pretty straightforward. It's saying that if you're steering, if your front wheel is further away from your center of mass and your front, and your, um, front wheel has a higher cornering stiffness, then as you give steering angle inputs, you're going to give more yaw moment. Does that make sense? Cool, so that's this in the yaw moment equation. It corresponds to this derivative quantity. The next one is the yaw velocity derivative. Okay, so this is looking at our yawing moment as compared to our yawing speed. And this one is really interesting because this is actually a yaw damping term. Are people familiar with what dampers do? Kind of. So what a damper does is if you have some force, a damper is going to provide a counter force that is like proportional usually to speed. Or if you, sorry, normally they're proportional to speed. So if you have some speed, then a damping force is going to apply a force that's in the negative direction compared to the speed and is proportional to that speed. So a very common example is something like air resistance, because the faster you move through something, the more air resistance slows you, like the more force air resistance applies to slow you down. You kind of believe me there? A little bit? Cool. So what this term is doing is it's saying, if you have some yaw velocity that your car is experiencing, meaning your car is like pivoting at some speed, um, the tires are going to fight that yaw velocity. And what's interesting about this is it's a function of the speed that you're going at. And so if you're at zero speed, you have nearly infinite yaw velocity, which is saying that it's very, very difficult to yaw your car if you're going at zero speed. And it's inversely proportional to your speed, so the faster you go, the easier it is to yaw your car. And this is a function of the square between your tire's distance in the center of mass, and then linearly related to the corner stiffnesses. So if you have really high corner stiffnesses, it's difficult to yaw your car. If you have really low corner stiffnesses, it's easier to yaw your car. And this is always fighting that yaw, which is kind of cool. So this is, this is a function of, this is called, um, well, this isn't the controller, but, What's interesting about this is in some oversteer cars, what you'll see is there's a certain speed at which this term is so low that any amount of steering input will cause your car to actually like spin out of control. And that's sort of covered further in the chapter, but it's called the critical speed of an oversteer car. And then it's kind of interesting. Okay. Um, the next one is called the body slip derivative. And so this is, also called the over undershoot derivative because it is a difference of the moment produced about the center of mass by the front and rear tires and it's a function of the body slip angle. So this is exactly what we were talking about with comparing all the different neutral steer, oversteer, understeer cases is exactly looking at this quantity, which is a relationship between how far away your relative front and wheel, front and rear wheels are from the center of mass and how much cornering surface they have. And so if this is positive, then you have an understeer car. If this is negative, then you have an oversteer car. 
And so they give this example. One example they give is like a weather vane. I think it's kind of weird. But a cool example they give is this one here, which is kind of saying, if this quantity was plotted along the center line of your car, if it's in front of your center of mass at all, it acts like a spring that's pulling, that's trying to align your velocity vector back with the vehicle center line. And that's what understeer does. Understeer is constantly trying to realign your vehicle's body with um, its center line. Whereas the oversteer case is usually trying to do the opposite. The oversteer case is an unstable case where it's trying to basically unalign your body with the direction that it's heading. And so this derivative is really interesting because it can tell you a lot of information about how close you are to a neutral versus over under your car. Um, yeah, honestly, I think the Yamba one was more interesting. So I'm not gonna cover the next ones. It's past seven. So I think let's take some time to take some questions and then we'll let everybody go. I'll give one quick little, like maybe why does this all matter? Um, so here's why it matters. If you have an understeer car, it is, as we sort of discovered, it takes more steering angle to more steering input to hit the same radius turn. And so, but it, what it also means, as we see in this sort of like control example, is it's a much more stable car because it's always trying to realign itself with the direction that it's facing. So almost, not almost, every single passenger car on the road is usually an understeer vehicle. Because for a passenger car, it's okay if the driver needs to like put in a little bit more steering angle to like hit a tighter turn. Like people will sort of naturally do that. It's not okay for a car to all of a sudden spin out because it's trying to throw the rear of the car out harder around a turn. So understeer cars are much more stable and much safer. And so every passenger car has some amount of understeer built into it. Um, race cars, we design our race car to be as close to neutral steer as possible. The reason for this is, again, sort of like a driver control thing. It's a little bit of oversteer can be helpful as you enter a turn because they can sort of like turn your nose and do a turn harder. Um, and so you'll initiate that turn faster and you can sort of turn again, like you can just turn faster when you need to, but it's very easy to lose control of the vehicle because it's trying to unalign itself. And so there's a case in which you like enter a turn, you oversteer and you just completely lose control of the vehicle and there's no way for you to regain control. Um, neutral steer is sort of like a happy medium for our car to exist in because we want our driver to be able to navigate tight turns at high speeds. And so we don't want them to be limited by the amount of steer angle that they can input. But at the same time, if it's unstable, it's gonna be like inevitably we're going to crash or we're going to slide out in a turn and that's not very good for going fast. When designing a car to be understeer or oversteer, do the engineers generally do that based on the position of the center of the mass, or do they do it based on cornering stiffness by like using different tires on the front and rear? Yeah, um, I would say cornering stiffness is closer of a is, is a better tuning knob than wheel position. Um, but as with anything with vehicle design or suspension design in particular, like everything is about compromise. Um, it's not terribly favorable to like have really drastically different positions of your wheels relative to your center of mass. But in a lot of cases, just the way the packaging of the car turns out, like specifically in combustion engines, engines are heavy as hell. Yeah. And there's a reason that they put them in the front of most passenger cars because they want to build an oversteer. They need a place to put the engine. And so it just makes a lot of sense to put a really heavy component of the car towards the front. And is that and why they do cars in like Lamborghinis and stuff like that? Yeah. Or and so like, like really high performance sports cars? Yeah. Like you'll see a lot of high performance sport cars are either rear engine or mid engine. Okay. 
Porsches are known for being super oversteery cars or having snap oversteer, which is slightly different because they're partly because their engines are way out in the back of the car. They're like past the rear axle. Yep. And so you can definitely account for like, if you have a really unfavorable center of mass position, you can account for that by changing cornering stiffnesses, but there's probably a lot of other compromises that you're making and changing what kind of tire to use. Um, what the yaw moment equation and the, um, the other one, the force equation. Um, so each derivative is useful for looking at how the car might perform and how stable it is. Um, it, what, what instance do you use the whole equation? Is there one? I mean, the whole equation gives you a way to analyze, like, like if you wanted to know how much lateral force you're going to have or experience in a certain case, like, I mean, that's what you use the equation for. Like it's, right. it's an equation of motion. It's used to describe the motion that your car um, goes into. I'd say a majority of what gets used, and you'll see this if you read further in the chapter, is like they just, the, the, honestly, like the rest of the chapter is grouping different quantities from that equation to describe different important things when race, or like when driving. Like they'll basically look at all these derivatives and like look at different cases and different, like, I mean, like they're basically different dimensionless quantities they can make from them that tell you different characteristics about your car. So yeah, I don't have, those, I mean, those are kind of the two big ones that I've seen is like, if you wanted to just strictly describe the force your car is experiencing, you could use this. Um, so they definitely would be useful to put into like a model if we wanted to make, we should make a bicycle model of our car. Like these equations would definitely be in there to describe the forces and moments our car was experiencing at any given point. And then, so like, if if you put plug everything in, you have a force equation, have your moment equation, your force mm -hmm. equation, uh, there's gonna be a given, you can, just due to centripetal acceleration, there's going to be a certain radius term that you will take for a given force. Yeah. Um, and then, and then there's also going to be a given radius term you can take given a moment. Mm -hmm. um, and with this, would like, if those radiuses don't match up, would this be the instance? Like, like I'm just trying to like, would a use case of these two equations be working out the radius of of curvature for a turn given the force and given the moment and mm. assuming your car is neutral steer and going through the turn normally they should match up and if it's if they don't match up you're either oversteering or understeering right would that be I, I haven't thought enough about the math but would that be a use for these Yeah, I think that's generally, yes. I can't give you the specifics of like a case in which it would work out. Or I, yeah, I can't like walk through a case for you. Like I wish I could, like, I think that'd be really helpful. But generally, yes. Like I think the important point is that like variations in the turn your car is subjected to based on the lateral acceleration and like the central acceleration versus the path it's going to take relative to the moment that it's experiencing. Like those two things are both factors on the path it'll take and some discrepancy between those will change the path. Yeah, I don't have like, or I haven't found like some magic equation that combines the two into the actual like geometric path your car takes. Um, yeah. Which is why I think it's sort of like, yeah, like, and that's sort of like the difference between using these in the modeling sense versus using these for like understanding the vehicle a little bit more. Um, the point, of, the point of like the presentation today was kind of covering more how can we use these to help us think about what the vehicle is doing in different cases. Um, but moving forward, I think we should definitely, and I mean, this is sort of getting to the end of like my understanding of these things. And so like moving forward, there's definitely room to begin to move into, okay, how do we take these and turn them into an actual like forward oil or a bull model, which is probably some combination of these equations. Sounds good.
Anything um, what's up? Clover. I was going to say anything else. Anyone else have any questions? Um, so in the reading, there was like a little diagram with like Ackerman parallel and reverse Ackerman steering. Um, I'm just wondering like which one do we use? Ackerman. Presumably. Yeah. We designed to have 100% standard Ackerman at low, like, or at really high radius turns, if you will. Like a one speed. So we basically, your Ackerman changes as your wheels turn because the, that, like, relationship is not necessarily linear. And so we try and make it be as close 100% for high radius turns. So as you begin to like turn your wheels, we want that to be 100% Ackerman, meaning our wheels are on concentric paths. Mm -hmm. uh, and it sort of drops off from there as the radius gets tighter. Okay, so as close to Ackerman as we can? Or... Yeah. Okay. Normal Ackerman means that your inside wheel turns more than your outside wheel because your outside wheel is going to follow a wider path than the inside wheel. Yeah, okay. So the Baja car, like not this last one, but the one before it, they accidentally flipped their steering geometry and they did reverse Ackerman. So the inside wheel turned less than the outside wheel and it made it uh -huh. impossible to steer at any speed because you just kind of plow, plow through whatever surface you're driving on. Oh, and yikes. <laughs> The, I think the reason we do 100% Ackerman at low speeds, kind of wider turns, is because Ackerman makes your car easier to steer and to push. Um, and at high speeds, um, it's at high speeds, it's going to be easier to steer your car than it is going to be at low speeds. So it's more important to have geometry that makes it easy to steer at low speeds. Yep. Okay. Wait, what's a hundred percent Ackerman versus like just any percent Ackerman? Ackerman. Hundred percent is where if you look at this diagram, is my screen sharing showing RSVD or the presentation right now? Pres the presentation. presentation. Gotcha. Um, so here you can see that the center of the turn, the center of the circles that the wheels are on for the front and rear match up like hit the same point yeah this is like what's what call like 100 percent accurate oh okay so if they were slightly off that would be yeah, like so you see on the parallel they don't hit and reverse accurate yeah. even further away okay i don't know what constitutes like 100 percent versus zero percent or like what the function is the mass between those two values but it exists somewhere okay Cool. All right. I'm going to end this um, recording. Yep.